Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is the new and very dangerous alliance between Iran and Russia. It's a biggie. Russia and Iran are collaborating on cybersecurity and defense, as well as offense. And that's not conjecture, it's cold, hard fact. In late January, the Russians and the Iranians signed an agreement that puts in danger the entire Western world. The signing went mostly unnoticed in the Western media. But the Iranian media covered this news. And frightening and unbelievable development. Tazneem, which is an official Iranian media outlet, reported on the, the agreement. They quoted Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov saying, quote, the document gives us the opportunity to coordinate our activities given the growing importance of cyber issues and their increasing impact on international relations, as well as on situations in various countries, unquote. The outline of the agreement is very straightforward, according to Tazneem. The objective is to coordinate the activities of Russia and Iran in combating cyber crime, cybersecurity, and information technology for national security and intelligence. This agreement puts Israel and the Western nations, all other Western nations, all targets of Iran directly in the crosshairs of Iran. With the help of Russia, countless many U.S. and Israeli companies and websites will be subjected to extremely sophisticated cyber attacks. And to state the obvious, the future of warfare is now cyber warfare. The implications are enormous. Iran is angry and they are frustrated. Four of Iran's ports and military targets were recently cyber attacked. In response, because Israel's military defense is so strong, the Iranians attempted to cyber attack Israeli ports. They failed. So Iran was forced instead to attack softer Israeli targets. This go around, uh, they were actually succeeded and Iranians, Iran successfully cyber attacked the customs office of Israel. While the Iranian attack on the Israeli port did delay some ships, it was mostly an inconvenience. Earlier, Iran struck much more sensitive targets, this time Israel's water and sewage departments. The cyber attack was almost is completely repelled, but more than that, Iran showcased their cyber skills and capabilities, and then the city of Tehran became the victim of a cyber attack. Sirens and alarms were sounded all over the city recently. There were serious power outages, and actually a missile from the Iranian site was shot from one of the defense facilities. They called it a mistake. The battles, if not the actual war, have begun. Iranians have certainly successfully improved their cyber systems. In one instance of their new cyber prowess, the Iranians hacked an Israeli insurance company and posted the names of all the company's clients online. Iran has improved, but they know their limitations and realize that as advanced as they have become, Iranian cyber offense and defense capabilities are dwarfed in comparison to Russia. So Iran wanted Russia's help in advancing their cyber defense and attacks, and now they have it. There is no doubt that future conflicts will involve cyber attacks. The attacks will strike at nerve centers. They will cause massive harm by simply stopping elementary yet crucial services like electricity and water. Iran knows it, Israel knows it, Russia knows it, the United States knows it. Iran is going to gain a lot from Russia because of this new agreement that they have recently signed. But that this is not just a one-way street. It's not a humanitarian or simply a friendly gesture by the Russians. Russia, too, will gain. Firstly, they will irritate and agitate the United States. But Russia will also have new strength in the Middle East. And that is extremely pleasing to them. They will have access to Iranian intelligence and cyber information. And that, too, would be good. They will be able to further hone, plan, and implement their Middle East strategies. Especially important for Russia is Iran's information on the United States and on Israel. Russia will also gain access to and an understanding of Iran's rapidly developing nuclear and oil systems. As Iran's sponsor, Russia will be privy to an intimate view of Iran's activities and intentions. Iran is a disruptor in the region. Russia leadership sees itself as an important influencer in the region. Now, with this new agreement, Russia will have more input and more ability to guide Iran 
in their disruptions, Russia and Iran will work together with quantifiable benefits. The damage that they can do to the rest of us, however, is unquantifiable. It's too large to even predict right now because of this new and tighter and even uh, uh, bond between Russia and Iran. The rest of us, Israel, the United States, the Western world, and Sunni states are at risk. Coming up next, points of view. First up is an editorial from the online version of The Jewish Week. The Jewish Week no longer puts out a print edition. The weekly notes of editor Andrew Silo Carroll are emailed. And that's where this piece appeared in an email. Andrew Silo Carroll was named editor in 2020, successor to longtime editor Gary Rosenblatt. And now the paper is online only. The New York Jewish Week was once a tremendous newspaper, a Jewish newspaper of tremendous silk. Until now, the paper never really made its transition to digital and gutted its staff to do it. When the world was going digital, the Jewish Week partnered with the Times of Israel for some reason. Almost everything published online for the Jewish Week was done through the Times of Israel. This once venerable Jewish paper still has interesting stories and insights from time to time. This piece is one example. The Jewish Week has begun returning to discussions of Jewish ideas, discussions, not just thoughts and opinions expressed by various rabbinic voices, but real thoughts and opinions by ideas and about ideas. This piece is called Jewish Spotting and was distributed on Sunday, January, uh, February 7, 2021. This title has been used before. It was borrowed for this column. The premise of the piece is, how do you relate to public Jews? Are they Jewish in name only? And what happens when they, are, or when they do not affiliate as being Jews? All good questions. This is how Andrew Silo Carroll begins. My colleagues at JTA and the Jewish News Service, the Jewish News Service, recently ran a feature. All Jews Joe Biden has tapped for top roles in his administration. Alison Kaplan Summer, who writes for Haaretz, was amused, tweeting, when you see the headline, all Jews Joe Biden has tapped for top roles in his administration, do you think Jewish or Israeli publication or anti-Semitic website? It's a close call. Alison has been writing for Jewish media that is Jewish ethnic media, lest the conspiracy mongers get the wrong idea, for nearly as long as I have. And we've often joked about the weird nature of our jobs. My version of the joke is that the Jewish newspapers and anti-Semitic press run the same articles with different adjectives. Some find this sort of ethnic pride troubling, parochial at best, dangerous at worst. Of course, parochialism is baked into the formula of ethnic media. I've often said that Jewish journalism is like hometown, a hometown newspaper, which doesn't hesitate to quell or grumble when one of its own makes news. For a delightful uh, niff on this, see the Queen's Daily Eagle, which runs joking headlines about Donald Trump's like Queen's man impeached again, or people love it. Uh, David Brand, the editor's managing editor, told the New York Times, it is self-parody of local news, and I think people get it. Andrew lays out the situation well. He argues that one needs to see the topic through the Jewish angle, not simply their Jewish names. He continues, our town just happens to be defined not by a geographic border, but by membership in the Jewish people. So when the rest of the world is reporting that Jeff Bezos to step down as Amazon CEO, Andy Jassy to take over, we write, Amazon's next CEO, Andy Jassy, is Jewish. And where do you draw the line? Mark Zuckerberg is Jewish. Does everything he do qualify as Jewish news? My answer is no, except when his actions touch directly on Jewish communal preoccupations, like curbing Holocaust denial and other forms of anti-Semitism and hate speech, or when he himself is victim of anti-Semitic invective. On the sliding scale of Jewish interests from lowest to highest, there's the fact of an appointment followed by precedent. What Jews have been in this role before? Followed by the significance of their Jewish biography. Andrew Silo Carroll is asking powerful and important questions about who certain people are and who we are as a community and as a people, who Jews claim and whether they are Jewish at all. He writes, the best and most defensible kinds of guess who's Jewish stories 
are those in which the Jewish biography is unmistakably germane to the news itself. Exhibit Alejandro Mayorkas, the new Homeland Security Secretary. His Jewish parents brought him from Cuba to the United States as a child, and his mother is a Holocaust survivor. Mayorkas, is in, in his confirmation testimony, spoke about that family history, saying it made him profoundly aware of the threat and existence of anti-Semitism in our country and the world, and discrimination of all forms. It's not only interesting to us that he's Jewish, but his Jewishness has shaped how he intends to carry out his job. The flip side of Mallorca's story, at least for, the, for liberal Jewish readers, was that of Stephen Miller, the architect of Trump's restrictionist immigration policies. The Jewish media treated Miller's Jewish upbringing as significant because his politics seemed to be so at odds with the way the minor, majority of Jews view immigration. It's our job to discuss how individual and corporate Jewish identity function in the world and that made reporting about Miller's Jewishness perfectly legitimate. But sometimes people make mistakes. And today, people choose to be Jewish, and many Jews, even some celebrities, opt out of and simply do not affiliate as Jews. He continues, One of Allison's colleagues did point out one of the uglier sides of identifying Jewish newsmakers, essentially, who is a Jew and who decides. It can be a sordid and chutzpahdik exercise, looking for hints of celebrity Jewish background and then claiming him or her. The Jewish media found this out the hard way when it gushed about Ella Emhoff, whose father, Doug Emhoff, is Jewish and happens to be married to Vice President Kamala Harris. The forward even named her to its forward 50 list of influential Jews. The only problem is Ella Emhoff doesn't identify as Jewish as a family spokesperson told the forward, we all had to change our tune. But the occasional flub doesn't invalidate the basic exercise. There is value in ethnic pride. Seeing co-religionists sitting in places of influence or shaping public affairs in ways that are either consciously Jewish or have an impact just by the fact of their Jewishness. Every minority indulges in this exercise and no one begrudges the black or the LGBTQ reader who thrills when a member of their community is elevated in one way or the other. By the same token, it is also the role of the ethnic media to identify wrongdoing among its own, even at the risk of comforting their enemies. A Cuban Jewish immigrant who now heads Homeland Security is part of the Jewish story. So is the scammer who used his connections among fellow Jews to pull off the Ponzi scheme. Irving Howe once praised the Yiddish forward for the sustained curiosity it brought to the life of its own people. We owe our readers nothing less. Andrew Silo Carroll, thank you for a spectacular piece. This is what Jew the Jewish Week should be writing about and discussing, and the rest of the Jewish media should be involved in these ideas also. Next up is a column by Itamar Eichner from Ynet, published February 4th, 2021. It's entitled, Is Biden Ghosting Netanyahu? Subtitle is, Analysis, The Lack of a Call from the Oval Office Viewed Alongside the List of World Leaders the New U.S. President Has Already Spoken To Could Hint That the New White House Is Less Inclined to Give the Prime Minister a Boost Ahead of the March 23rd Elections. This is an excellent example explaining the importance of strong, healthy, good relations between the United States and Israel. When the relationship is strong, good, and healthy, it can lead to very good situations. But when it's not strong, good, and healthy, it can lead to terrible situations. Eichner begins by laying the groundwork for his thesis. He writes that the new administration is creating its Middle East policy without Israeli input. Wow. This is how he begins. Two weeks after his inauguration, U.S. President Joe Biden has yet to call Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, a sharp contrast to his predecessor, Donald Trump, who called the Israeli leader three days after entering the White House. Biden was to deliver his first foreign policy speech from the White House on Thursday, flanked by Vice President Kamala Harris, 
covering a range of topics, including Iran and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Can you imagine a U.S. president announcing his Mideast policy about Israel never having spoken to the Israeli prime minister? Wow again. That is the second time I'm saying wow. Of course, there are close interactions between Israel and the United States on the cabinet level. These are important in terms of the follow-up on policy, but the chiefs have to set the tone. Eichner writes, Mossad Chief Yossi Cohen is expected to arrive in Washington soon to meet a long list of dignitaries to whom he will present Israeli intelligence on Iran's violations of the nuclear deal. Eichner concludes that Bibi needs to get serious about this. In the meantime, Netanyahu is expected to appoint a project manager to coordinate contacts between the United States and other officials in the international community on Iranian issues. So while Israel's voice is being heard, the words may prove to have fallen on deaf ears as the United States is already pushing to return to the nuclear deal despite Tehran's refusal to make any concessions. Coming up, commentary through cartoons where pictures tell the story. I want to show you four cartoons today. First up is a play on the new direction education is heading in and the new language that's developing in our world in general. A language which uses emojis and other symbols sometimes more often than actual words. They use numerals instead of the words also. A teacher stands in front of the board and a symbol is on the board. The teacher asks the meaning of the symbol she wrote. Her answer is yes, a winky face is correct. But in ancient times, she says, the semicolon was used to separate archaic written devices known as complete sentences. Second up is a simple comparison of last year and this year. The title is must have items in 2020 and 2021. Last year, at this time, people were running around all over looking for toilet paper. This year, everyone is running around to find the COVID vaccine. Next is a cartoon that reads, um, and it's a painting that was drawn in 1962, and it's entitled 2022. Everyone is in their glass dome. It truly describes our situation. Last up is a cartoon which so perfectly describes our situation to fight COVID right now and the new variants, which are even more dangerous and contagious, though less lethal than the original virus. A physician is holding a vaccine. COVID is in front of it. Behind him is one of the new mutants. He says, it's right behind me, isn't it? Oh, is it ever? That's the truth. It's an unbelievable commentary on what we're fighting right now. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. Israel's ambassador to France, Daniela Saada, was interviewed on BEURFM radio. BEURFM radio is a French national station that caters to North African communities throughout France. They broadcast in French and Arabic and in other Berber languages. Saada was interviewed by two hosts on the show that discussed the Abraham Accords and especially the new relationship between Israel and Morocco. The two hosts were suspended and sanctioned for hosting the interview with the Israeli ambassador. The hosts were stunned. Local proceedings have now commenced against the station for illegally suspending and sanctioning the host. This is most certainly a form of discrimination. Palestinian Authority has begun planting trees, trees, to memorialize terrorists. The PA decided to plant trees so that they can sanctify terrorists and make certain that they eternally remain in our hearts. That's the quote, eternally remain in our hearts. According to an advisor to Abbas, the initiative honors the martyrs who are the most precious thing we have in our history, unquote. The father of a terrorist expressed his pleasure at the initiative and said, Quoting, every day we will grow a tree, every day we will grow a martyr, unquote. The list of people the PA has chosen to honor with trees is astonishing and abhorrent at the same time. They include self-sacrificing fighter martyr Dalal Mugabri, that's their terminology, who led mass murder of 37 Israeli civilians, including 12 children. 
their tent language again, Mar their commander Fatih Shakaki, founder of the terrorist organization Islamic Jihad, Mar their commander Salah Kali, who planned the massacre of 11 Israeli athletes during the Olympic Games. Thank you to Palestinian Media Watch for this, because they brought it to my attention, for their descriptions of these Palestinian terrorists and for bringing this initiative to all of our attention and to the attention of the world. A fragment of royal purple-blue cloth dating to a thousand before the Common Era, BCE, was recently discovered in the Israeli desert near the Dead Sea in a place called Slaves Hill. The dig in which the cloth fragment was unearthed has been dated to the time of the reign of King David. The royal purple cloth is officially known as Argaman, the cloth of that color, which came from a murex sea snail, was more valuable than gold. The color does not change over time. It does not fade. 3,000 years later, the purple is still the same purple. Textiles made their way from the Mediterranean coast, where the snails were caught, to Jerusalem, where the clothing was worn. And this small fragment, and much other, I presume, is proof that there was much more interaction between the geographic areas and socioeconomic groups than historians and archaeologists had up until now thought. It is now clear that the people of the rural desert and royalty must have interacted. Palestinians have always felt secure about imploring the international community to lead and plead their case to defend them. Their use of the International Criminal Court, the ICC in The Hague, is a perfect example of this. The international community, and especially the ICC, is a reflection of thinking and the tone of the power as it's set on the international scene. Four years ago, under the Trump presidency, the Palestinians and their cause were sidelined. And for the past year, even their fellow Arabs relegated Palestinian issues to the margins. Things have changed once Joe Biden took office, and now the Palestinians are making certain not to miss that opportunity. Not waiting for the result of the Israeli election scheduled for March 23rd, the Palestinians have mounted a diplomatic full court press in Europe. They're also pursuing Israel by way of the ICC, the International Criminal Court. And the ICC has ruled that they now have jurisdiction over the Palestinian territories. Israel needs to clearly show where they stand, especially on this issue of the Palestinian statehood. For years, Israel embraced ambiguity. It was safe. But because of the changes in the White House, real decisions are going to have to be forced upon the region. In order to properly respond, Israel must know its options and plan adequately and appropriately. This is not just important. It is crucially important. First, though, we would like to discuss the hatred, the vitriol, the political opportunism that has brought us here today. The hatred that the House managers and others on the left have for President Trump. The lead defense lawyer for former President Donald Trump in his second Senate trial for impeachment is David Schoen. Schoen is an Orthodox Jew, and he requested that proceedings halt from Friday evening through Saturday evening during the Sabbath. The request was granted by Senator Chuck Schumer, also. Jewish, but not as observant a Jew as Shom. From the Jewish perspective, the appointment of Shom to lead attorney is a tremendous Kiddush Hashem, which is an act that elevates and highlights the beauty of Judaism and the beauty of God. It is a clear demonstration that accommodations can and should be made for Sabbath observers, and that Sabbath observers can and should request those accommodations. It is a clear demonstration that being a Sabbath observer should not be thought of as a professional hindrance. Schoen did not make his request of the Senate at the last minute. He let them know up front, respect is a two-way street. That literally puts the institution of the presidency directly at risk if any given group elected to the House decides that what was thought to be important service to the country when they served now deserves to be canceled. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. 
Andrew Silo Carroll concludes his piece by quoting Irving Howe. Howe was the great chronicler of American Jewry. Irving Howe's writings, essays, and books are all worth reading, even if you disagree with him. He wrote on politics, and he wrote on American Jewish life. Scholars of his writing and his fans have been debating which of his works are his greatest works. It's a toss-up to me between the world of our fathers and the treasury of Yiddish stories, which was the foundation, of course, of a course that he gave on the Yiddish story at Brandeis University. The World of Our Fathers is a remarkable social history, one of the greatest social histories I've ever read, of the great society created by Eastern European Jews after they came to the United States. Irving Howe does not make up stories and jokes, but he collected them. His work has filled, is filled with stories about, uh, by Shalom Aleichem, about uh, Yud Lamed Peretz, of uh, Isaac Gesheva Singer, and many other greats. His writings are filled with humor and pathos. The most quintessential Jewish story is one that takes place in the Carnegie Deli. Almost everyone knows it, and we all still laugh. Uh, Goldberg comes into the restaurant and orders chicken soup. He calls over the waiter, who has been working there for decades, and asks him to taste his soup. The waiter says, Mr. Goldberg, you've been coming here for 30 years and every day you order the same soup. It's no different today than it was yesterday or 30 years ago. They go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, try the soup, try the soup, don't try the soup, you've been here, try the soup, back and forth and back and forth. Finally, the waiter succumbs and says, okay, I'll try the soup. Where's the spoon? Goldberg says, aha. For Irving Howe, that aha was everything. When it comes to communication, that single aha is not merely a one word joke. It's not the punchline. It's a complete paragraph. A man of people, Howe actually played himself in Woody Allen's movie, Zelig. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Micah Alpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS.